Iphigenia in Splot by Gary Owen. Holly Mazza and Kyle Drakes in conversation with director Rachel O'Riordan. Holly and Kyle are sitting in the auditorium of a small cinema room that has blue chairs. Rachel is sat to their right and in the row in front. Holly is a white woman with medium length dark brown hair and wearing round framed glasses. Kyle is a mixed race student with curly dark brown hair. They are wearing a white short sleeve shirt. Rachel is a white woman with straight blonde hair and is wearing a grey top. Hi, my name's Holly Mazza. I'm the head of drama at Fulham Boys School and I'm joined by Kyle Drakes, a year 12 student, and Rachel O'Riordan, the artistic director of the Lyric Hammersmith and the director of Iphigenia in Splot currently at the theatre. Hi, Rachel. Hi. So this is a really political play and it's important that it speaks to an audience in 2022. Why do you think it's still relevant to the audience today? When we first produced this play in 2015, it felt very relevant then because the play speaks broadly about class. Um, it certainly speaks um, about class and delineations of social structure that mean that some people live a very different life to others. Thematically, it addresses austerity, cuts, um, and how people are going to survive. Now, seven years ago when we first produced that play, that felt very relevant. And what is shocking to me and sad to me, and I'm sure it will be to everyone who comes to see it, is that it actually feels more relevant seven years later. So the choice to programme it here in West London on this beautiful stage in the Lyric is really driven by external circumstances so the relevance hasn't like it sometimes does with plays diminished with new plays it's actually enhanced and it feels quite different it feels sadder it feels like a call to arms typically theatre audiences might be made up of people who might be quite left-wing leaning mm. that's maybe a stereotype of theatre um, how do you ensure that this isn't just playing to an echo chamber that's a really good question i really hope the audiences aren't just made up of left-wing people. I, I take your point, um, but what theatre a theatre audience should be is a really broad church. It's it is for everyone, and that means everyone. So um, my hope is that people who come to see anything on the Lyric Hammersmith stage are surprised, challenged, entertained, made to laugh, made to cry, all of those things. But actually. You're right. I don't know if we if we are doing that because what I, I think can happen absolutely is that people go and see the thing that they think speaks to them, and actually perhaps we'd all be better off going to see the thing that we think doesn't speak to us. To go and to select to go and see a piece of theatre that we think well maybe that's not actually targeted at me, but maybe it's got a broader story that I might be interested in. So the only way we ever know with theatre is by programming it and putting it on the stage. There is absolutely no way to program a theatre intellectually. You have to do it from your heart and your gut. And um, that way you find out what it is, rather than knowing what it is. And uh, the, in, the, the interesting interaction, the alchemy between audience and, and piece of theatre is, isn't something you can second guess actually. You have to do it to find out. That's the scary part. You, you know, there's no, um, guarantee system you just do it and then you know so i don't know actually i don't know you could be well right i hope you're not <laughs> i think it was interesting even you know whatever your political assuasion is it challenged the complacency that people might hold yeah. around these topics and it really felt like once you've seen it you want to go out and do something about it not just talk about it we had to, this morning we did a run-on of the piece and we had um in watching some of our springboard cohort and I, springboard is a training program we run here at the lyric and one of the springboard participants said to me that that she uh, effie played by sophie melville is a very unlikable character which she is deliberately she's not supposed to be um warm and easy to like so the, it's it's not virtue signally it's not messagey this is a very difficult young woman in very difficult circumstances, who doesn't always behave well, but in the course of the play, at one 
massive moment became, behaves in an extraordinary way. But actually, she's not likable. And I think that's a really key thing. She's not, she's an unreliable narrator. She's difficult. She says things we don't like. She can be offensive. So we're not saying, look at this lovely person. Isn't it awful? You know, we should, we're saying, look at this very difficult person. Look at this difficult person and look at the things she's doing wrong by society's lights. But she has very little investment in society. But I would say that the audience might ask themselves, why should she have an investment in a society that has very little investment in her? So we have to ask ourselves, is she unlikable or is that our lens on the character? Are we deciding she's unlikable through our lens, our setup? If we are, we need to actually ask ourselves about that first. Judging based on that answer, do you want Effie to sort of be a challenge towards the audience to break free of their almost stereotypical views uh, against someone who's been through austerity? Because um, if you look at, I'd argue, like in England and the UK in general, uh, classism is probably one of the biggest social injustices that there is right now because everyone's always been, it's like a huge thing in our country mm. and our overall society. So are you giving the audience a chance to change their views and leaving it up to interpretation on how mm. they take it away from the play? Much better than I said it, yes. Um, I think the fact you're even saying classicism is quite a big thing. We try and pretend here that I'm not, I'm not British, I'm Irish. And um, I do find that the British class system is very, it's like embarrassed. People don't want to talk about it. They try and pretend it's not there. And that's dangerous. So yes, I am. I am trying to make uh, uh, the play is trying, not me, but programming the play is trying to say, to ask an audience to interrogate their own views, to interrogate their prejudgments, actually. Because the class system only works if everyone buys into it, right? It ceases to work if we cease, if we cease to accept it. And that's what I'm back to when you picked up on this brilliantly. Because of, because of what I said about her not invest, she doesn't invest in the society that doesn't invest in her. The class system is basically a structure that we all have to adhere to if it's going to work. So what happens if somebody says stop? Stop adhering to it. Think. Do you have to accept that because you're born into this situation, you can only go this far? And who says? Who says who gets to sit at the table? For so many years, Every job that was important in this city, your city, was only done by a certain type of person. That change is coming, it's slow, but people like me wouldn't have got this job 10, 15 years ago. So change, is, change is coming, but we have to keep shipping away at it because it's been here a long time, the class system. Obviously, Gary Owens is Welsh, and yes. I understand none of the cast are, or creative team are even from England. So <laughs> does that, uh, does that affect the way you're, you've produced this play and does it like give you a different lens into the issue of mm. like the English society because obviously you're looking at it from an outside view rather than one from inside? Yeah, I live here now. I feel very much like a Londoner. What I love about London is you can come here and become one, you know, and like this is such a, uh, this is a cliched thing to say, but melting pot. Um, but I love being part of that. I feel like I can be here. Um, as an Irish person, but yeah, you're right, you're right. Um, that's a good question. When we did the play first, 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 um, when I was trying to sort of talk to other theatres about perhaps touring it, people said, no, it's not gonna work because nobody knows where Splot is. It do, it'll be alienating. And I was like, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because Splot is everywhere. Splot is Toxteth, is, is Moss Side, is the Falls Road and Belfast. Is, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's a splot everywhere in every major city. So we did tour it and it didn't matter. People, yes, she's Welsh, yes, it's set in Wales, but it kind of doesn't matter because what she speaks of is, is really universal, unfortunately. It's, it's, it's her lived experience and her lived experience happens in Cardiff. But I don't think that the fact that none of us are from London, or indeed England actually, as you rightly point out, who made the show, I don't think it matters at all, because it's an urban play. But really, more than that, it's a play about, yeah, it's an urban play about who matters and who doesn't matter. I, th I think, and I really hope, 
that it that, that, that it transcends its Cardiffness. When watching it, we thought maybe it was quite an in-your-face style production. Uh, and there are moments that are really shocking and challenging for the audience. And yet, at the same time, you manage to take the audience with you throughout the production. I've heard stories of people sort of leaping to their feet during the performance and applauding moments. How did you and Sophie together work out where that line is and tread that balance carefully? We st we're still doing it. Like, remounting it for the lyric was a reimagining again of how we've never done it in a proscenium arch before. So that technically and, and actually not just technically, in, in the heart and soul of it as well, needed a reinvention. I don't know. You never know, Holly. You never know in rehearsals. You, I never direct going, oh, and this is going to make an audience feel this. And I know how to make them feel that. And I know how to make them angry. And I know how to make them cry. I don't really direct like that. It's more about I sort of gun into the truth of it as much as I can. And whatever happens, happens. I think it's just trying to create a room, a rehearsal room, where there's a fearlessness. It doesn't always happen on everything I've ever directed. But when it works, it makes for a very free, brave rehearsal room. And in that space, magic can happen if you manage to set that room out that way. And it allows people to feel things quite intensely, be they the sound designer or be they me or be they the actor or whoever. And um, that will translate to the audience then. So it all goes into really um, how you set the rehearsal process out. And when you're working on material that is potentially devastating, you can't do that carefully. You've got to go and do that full on. What it sounds like to me is you've really honoured the text and you've really rooted your rehearsal process in sort of telling, doing Effie justice, essentially. That's beautifully um, put. Yes. But the reality is it's a massive monologue, isn't it? And, and I imagine as a new director, you might look at that and go, where on earth do I begin? Uh, did, you, did you chunk the text down? Did you unit hmm. it? How did you approach it? Right. So it's interesting you say this. I agree. So the play is written without a single stage direction. It's just one long monologue. So everything you see on the stage was my intervention, if you like, and creation in the room. There's no kind of, and then she sits down. And, and in fact, actually, I think Gary thought when he gave me the play first that I would just do it with her just standing and saying it. But that's, that's up to, that was up to my interpretation of it, um, which is a very physical one. I hope that somebody else takes this play and does it completely differently and decides to not do it that way and sort of like my way and do it a different way. Um, I didn't unit it, interestingly, which you'd think I would with a big monologue, wouldn't you? But I didn't actually. It's broken into um, scenes. And so we just worked on each scene and then um, did it that way. Um, it was very, the process I used was very rooted in physical theatre. So, Actually, if any, I think we went we went into the gut of it rather than sitting and doing an academic exercise like uniting. Garion's text is very rhythmic and mm. poetic. How did you and Sophie Melville uh, collaborate to come up with a sort of vocal and physical language for Effie? And I appreciate this might be a similar <laughs> response similar to the last question. Coming your way. The, 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 the vocal language is basically uh, in the cadence of a splot accent and the physical language is in the body of a, a woman from her background. That was it really. At GCSC, I'd sort of say that most students are taught to pick and choose the emotions from like, imagine like a hat. You just pick an emotion and then all of a sudden you have to act like that rather than have, as you mentioned, Effie is sort of one character, no matter the emotion. How would you go about past like GCSE and A-level, making that performer make sure that they're only one character with all the emotions inside, rather than the character split into all the different emotions? That is a brilliant question. And I think we can't pull an emotion out of a hat and decide what we'll be today or how we're gonna um, handle a certain situation all the time necessarily. I think what you're describing is a way of simplifying the portrayal of humanity. And while that is understandable in a learning environment, it's also reductive, as, you, as you've said, I think, um, that we are much more complex than that. 
it is entirely possible to be sad and angry at the same time and um, possibly on the same day. Um, so I think the, what you describe about breaking the character down into like two sides or what have you, we, I wouldn't do that in a rehearsal room at all because it simplifies something that is way, way, way more complex than that. And I think you're right, it isn't like pulling something out of a hand, play this, play that, because actually that's not what we're like. And often what we, and actually also to add another layer of complication, what we're playing sometimes, if you like, how we're going about the world is very far removed from what we're actually feeling. So in, the re in life, one wouldn't always feel and portray the same the same thing. But sometimes in theatre, when it's not necessarily particularly interesting, um, people feel and s demonstrate the same emotion. As they, they'll demonstrate the same emotions they're feeling, right? But actually, that's not really how people operate. <laughs> Rarely do we do that. Rarely. Most of the time, we've got a much more complex set of systems inside us um, to, 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 to filter and decide on how we're gonna present to the world. And actually, I don't tend to use techniques much in rehearsals, I don't tend to use technique books on things like that. But a thing I do come back to quite a lot, and it speaks into what your question is, is I talk about Stanislavski's work around sense memory. Um, and I think a muscle memory is very interesting to me, that we remember, we remember Th how we remember is very is fascinating to me like you you, you know you, we've all done it you sit on a chair and you go oh, it reminds you of oh I said last time I was here this happened you know so that kind of stuff really interests me but it's complex we are complex we don't think in straight lines and we certainly don't feel in straight lines so to me you can't go this is vulnerable Rachel this is angry Rachel this is happy Rachel I can't remember ever feeling just one emotion at a time I'm sure you can't so that's like that's not interesting theatre for an audience. So it's not the theatre I try and make. There was one moment in the play where Effie is talking about a story of watching her friends give uh, antifreeze to a kitten, and and then she mentions see or it starts by her seeing the cat outside, and the way I interpreted that was that the kitten is meant to be symbolic of Effie if she continues with the lifestyle she's living because throughout the play, Effie's been throwing up constantly. It, like, it's one of the first mm. things she, she mentions when she's on camera or on stage. And she's, she mentions the cat starts by throwing up mm. and then it throws up spit mm. and then it throws up nothing and then mm. it throws up blood. Mm -hmm. And then Effie throughout the play, she starts by throwing up loads. Mm. She goes out on the night out. Mm. She throws up more and then she goes with Lee. She gets pregnant, obviously. She starts throwing up again and then we can assume she's throwing up basically empty air at that point because she's thrown up so much and she's asking mm. where is it all coming from and then it gets to the point where she has to leave the house and so i interpreted that as if effie stayed in the house she would have ended up throwing up not literally throwing up blood but figuratively figuratively throwing up blood and then ending up in a worse cycle of or worse cycle than she began with and by her leaving the house she became like the wandering cat outside and now she's left to fend for herself. Is that sort of what you were going for or is it just a really... I think that's brilliant. I think that's brilliant. That's the brilliant thing about theatre is, because there's not a l that you make, you have your own response, right? It's not a literal moment as you've, you've totally noticed. If she's not, she, she's talking about one thing, she looks at, she sees the cat and then she remembers the kitten in the box. And yeah, she, I think she does feel, oh, what I talked about in rehearsal to Sophie just was um, that the kitten in the box is one kitten and there's six lads torturing it. So it's not fair. The kitten is tiny and weak and vulnerable. And essentially, for the way I was talking to Sophie about it, was that it's about her, yes, about her position in society, yes, she is vulnerable. And so is the baby that she's carrying at the time. Um, and I suppose sometimes I talk in rehearsal about the macro idea and the micro idea. 
the micro idea is that she feels that she, yeah, she is, she's, she is the cat going to be wondering she's out in the street like the cat absolutely right she's got no she says I've got no home and and I'm gonna have a baby and I think that's the micro and that's right what in that moment she is strongly connecting with that mangy tabby cat walking the streets on its own it's a stray but she's also thinking about the kitten in the box which is everybody who is vulnerable this is never fair if somebody is weak. So what we have an imbalance. We have, we have a tiny kitten who is being starved and then fed something. The kitten has no choice, so she'll take anything she's given. That's society. If you make people weak enough, they'll take whatever they're given. That's the macro idea. And it's where on that journey Effie's on, she starts to make those connections herself and she starts to, to see herself as not a victim, but as somebody whose position in the world is so vulnerable because of the circumstances of her birth and because the structure of society being what it is. So what she does with that vulnerability, she decides to protect something that's even more vulnerable than her, which is the baby that she's carrying. And I think that's the moment where she starts to become heroic. Because if you are vulnerable yourself and you try and protect something more vulnerable, that's extraordinary. So she starts to, she starts to get into her power. But yeah, totally, she is, she is the cat on the street, yeah. yeah. For any students looking to get into directing as a career, how would you suggest they start off and then further develop their skills? Because obviously GCSE and A-level drama are much more focused on the acting side mm. in terms of practicality. So how would you really initially get that first leap into the directing side of? That's so hard. To do. It is hard. I find it hard to give this advice because I didn't do any of it. And there are training courses now, uh, like MAs and so on at Birkbeck and things like that. Um, they're not accessible for everybody because it's an expensive thing to do. It's an industry. So getting into an industry is always, it takes strategy. Um, oh, it's difficult because my artistic answer is make your own work. Just do it somehow. Just get, a, just go and make work in a, a living room or a bedroom or write something, record it, make it, make it happen. Somehow that's really hard. That's the kind of romantic answer. Um, the more strategic answer is find ways to get yourself into theatres, buildings somehow. Um, assist people because you get paid for that now. You didn't when I was young, which is why I didn't do it. Um, and mm, when you assist people, don't necessarily think that their way is the right way, but learn to be in a rehearsal room. Just learn to be in a rehearsal room. That's all you need to learn from assisting is how to be in a rehearsal room. You definitely don't need to learn how to do what they do. Do you know what I mean? Because actually that'll just get in your way. You just need to, you need to just learn how to be in a rehearsal room, how to be in a theatre. There's things to learn, you know, there's language, there's techniques, there's, um, you know, just how to behave, or all of that stuff, how to handle your room, how all those, those, those are really helpful things to learn. But I tell you, it's, it's a good question because it's hard. Um, and I wouldn't pretend otherwise. And then becoming a director is weird because who tells you when you finally are one? You know, when you train to be a lawyer, there's a bit where you're signed off and you go, right, that's it, I'm a lawyer now, I can go away and practice being law. <laughs> or I'm a doctor, I now can do this thing, I've been trained to do it. With a director, you sort of constantly and still going, mm, am I? I remember like, I didn't call myself a director until, God, I'd been doing it probably for about five or six years because I was always doing other things as well, just to pay the bills. So I worked in bars, I worked in restaurants and I'd maybe direct one thing a year, if, like, if, if, if that. And so I kind of, I remember thinking to myself, well, I'm, I'm not making a living at it, so can I call myself one? So I think it's a journey up here as much as anything else towards how you feel about it and how you feel about yourself in it. And that's the biggest part of it. It's like, it's a joy of a job, but it's hard because you're holding lots of other people's experiences in your hands really and, and trying to make sure that everybody gets the best out of the process that you can possibly give them that the room that you're working in feels open and challenging and safe and brilliant and charged and all of those things and so you've got to you've got to be ready for that in you as well 
there's, you know, there's not an A, like probably like I direct actually, there's not an A, B, C equals now I'm a director. It's kind of a journey, you know, assisting is part of it, watching theatre is part of it, making theatre is part of it. And even if you make theatre and three people watch, that's an audience. And that's how you learn. You learn it by doing it. And that's not a great answer. But that is honestly my best advice. Direct your mates. Pick up a play, pick up a play that you think, well, nobody would ever want to come and see that. That's the best things to work on. Plays that you think, well, that's completely unstageable. No theatre in London's going to put on, I don't know, um, let's say, well, actually, I don't know, some old Irish play, for example, that you think, well, no one's going to stage that. It's got 19 people in it. Do that. You know, work on it with your mates. There's a lot of kind of, the fringe is really exciting to, to, to get, going and I was lucky when I started making theatre it was in Belfast in the very late 90s early 2000s and it was just post the Good Friday Agreement and it was a very interesting environment to be in because it was really quite untouched it was quite wild place in many ways it was quite untouched by a lot of things so there was a lot of there was a load of theatre being made political theatre it also I would say don't make theatre unless you actually really feel like you have to that you want to say something you know, that's such a long answer and I haven't given you proper strategic do this, this and this and this. That's because I can't. It is so much a journey of your own self towards being an artist of any kind. But being a director is a weird one because no one gives you the sign off and goes, that's it, you're done, you're cooked. You know, I'm still not, I'm still not done. You know, I'm still like learning, 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 learning. I'm going, damn, no, that's not right, geez, no, I need to look, get better at that. It's hard, but it's a craft and it's a lifelong thing. It's never finished. So you, you mustn't expect to be brilliant or perfect in the beginning, but you need to know that you have the thing in you that makes you want to do it. And then you will. And get on, to get into theatres, get into theatres. Most theatres now have some sort of pathway that you can get into, and if not, they should. Do you want to? Yeah. Mm, good. I think you'd be very good at it. Do you want to direct the stage? Uh, maybe. I've, I've sort of got, um, c trying to keep all the doors open yeah, right now. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Don't rush it. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's mainly learning about how you communicate with other people. That's the only, and I think you'd be very good at that. Is that how you, because all, all theatre is ideas, right? It's just ideas made alive. That's all theatre is. So it's about ma you know you you making sure that you can be a person that allows other people to get their ideas going. But start direct direct your mates make them be in it make them make them do it. <laughs> That's what I'd say. Did you mention Springboard earlier? Is that? It's an acting training course that we run here, <laughs> um, which is ten people per year. Um, it's for acting only at the moment and it's um, deliberately set out as an alternative to drama school. Not meant to be the same as drama school, but a completely different route. Um, mm. And it's like maybe, I suppose the best way to describe it would be almost like what would have been an apprenticeship. So they get loads of classes, they put on shows, they also learn about how a theatre works. It's like immersive. They have to, they're here for two years. It's by audition only. It's really unique. We're really proud of it, aren't we? Yeah. I think we're really lucky to have something like that in West London as well. I did the, yeah, yeah, well, in London, full stop, because I know that it's so difficult to get into drama school, really particularly is. if you don't have um, the funding. Yeah, that's exactly why it's why we did it. It's it's for people who who would find that tricky. Mm. It's the only for people actually who it's only for those people. Yeah. Thanks so much, Rachel. That concludes our interview with Rachel O'Riordan, the Artistic Director of the Lyric Hammersmith. Thank you.